Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome to Lee and the IC, the podcast in which you, dear listener, get to hear from one of the UK's best known private investors. I'm Alex Newman, an associate editor of the Investors Chronicle, and I'm once again here in the FT studios with Lord John Lee. John, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Fine. Nice and dry in here. Yes, <laughs> not so much outside. Um, as ever this month, we'll be looking at the latest movements in John's portfolio. But for the bulk of the podcast, we're going to return to our occasional format in which we interview the chief executive of one of the companies John invests in. Um, today, that chief executive is Richard Edwards, and that company is Ampario, the workshop-based feed additives group. Before we get talking and I introduce Richard, I should start with the disclaimer that everything we talk about on this podcast is for the purposes of education and entertainment, and none of it should be taken as financial advice or a recommendation to buy or sell shares. Richard, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, for those listeners out there who don't know much about Ampario, and given the size of the company, I suspect this might be quite a few of them, can I just ask you to briefly outline what the business does, What who are your customers, what problems are you trying to solve for them? Yeah, I mean, we're essentially what we call a speciality feed additive business into animal health. So, you know, our customers would be people producing chickens, eggs, um, milk, um, pork, uh, and, and even aquaculture on the fish side. And we do a little bit into pet, and we're, we're trying to grow more into, into the pet sector as well with some of our products. Our products are essentially, um, they sort of act like a probiotic. The main product, which is Origo Stim, would be oregano based, and it helps to improve the gut health and the gut microbiome. And there's quite a lot being talked about this with on the human side, actually. If you've got a better gut health, it really drives sort of 70 to 80 percent of your immunity and your health. It also takes out more efficiently the nutrients from the feed. So, for producers who are producing chickens, who you know as, as 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 much meat as possible quickly to get it on the supermarket shelf to give you know maybe the five pound cost chicken that can feed a family you know over the whole weekend, then that's important that it, it, the performance is there and the productivity is, is there and 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 that will lead to the profitability of of the farmer. So we're sort of essentially helping them um, get more efficient and more productive, but also in a natural and healthy way. And some of the problems that are obviously are in this industry. Are things like antibiotic resistance because of the overuse of antibiotics within within uh, the food chain and, and, and within animal uh, production. So our products can help reduce the amount of antibiotics used, and in some cases, you know, we have actually managed to replace them because the animals more healthy and able to um, cope with things like salmonella and E. coli and other infections. So do I take from that the you know the example you just gave of say a five pound chicken that you're not you're not just selling to necessarily the, the higher end organic uh, animal protein markets you are looking at a broad spectrum essentially the whole market we, we do yeah we we look at the, at the whole market it's um i mean in in some cases you know it, we we do well in places where it's organic and just recently we got the uh, it was a fibble organic registration across europe for for origo stim uh, product so it, it helps in there because there's a higher you know, we're a higher value add product company and those are higher value add type chickens but we are supplying into the normal what we call the broilers that are grown in in in, in uh, sort of 36 to 40 days or whatever and then on the supermarket shelf because we can help them improve their performance and they will get a return in terms of like what we call a feed conversion ratio so the the the, the animal would maybe require less feed to produce the same amount of um, of meat or weight or eggs additionally we can extend the lay of, an, of a, a laying hen for for a number of uh, extra eggs in a you know over a cycle and that's significant when you're talking about the billions of eggs that are produced it's a significant benefit that it pays for our product and just gonna, just so we get this really right about the i suppose the nature of your um your client base and just so we sort of going to properly define the products you're selling so why why might a um a potential client rely on um using antibiotics is it is that a, just a cheaper model is are there misconceptions around uh, the additives that that farmers need to use what are you sort of tackling or changing in the industry yeah the, the, i mean there's two types so there's in the past they've, they've used what they call antibiotic growth promoters where they, they were putting in a subclinical dose of antibiotic just to keep you know maybe some of the infection at bay the problem with a subclinical dose is as you know if you go to the doctor 
and they give you a course of seven days of antibiotics, you meant you're supposed to take the whole seven day course. When using a subclinical or lower dose, it allows um, bacteria to become resistant. And that is what the big issue is at the moment. Uh, and oh, well, it has been for a number of years, and it's probably only going to get worse. Um, so it, across Europe, these antibiotic growth promoters were banned and were taken out, couldn't be used. But you can still use therapeutic ones where you know, a vet would prescribe one to solve a particular issue that they've got. But even they are in now countries, I think the Netherlands is starting to look at how you're know, trying to limit the amount of therapeutic um, antibiotics that you would use. So it, it is an issue, but the, it, yes. Antibiotic growth promoters were cheap and cheerful and easy. The problem with an antibiotic in your gut health, it will kill good bacteria as well as bad bacteria. What our products do is kill the bad bacteria, but help promote good bacteria like lactobacillus. And so essentially a bit like you know, probiotic. And that's what Im improves the gut microbiome, Im improves the health of the animal and makes it more capable of, of fighting disease and infection like salmonella and E. coli. The best way to look at it, if you look at, Birds flying around that are natural, they've got a better gut health because they're feeding on you know, all different types of things, and and they can they will be carrying potentially salmonella and E. coli, but they're still performing well. Whereas when you're putting birds in in a bit more industrialized or an intensive approach to grow them, um, then there's a lot more challenge and a lot more stress yeah. on them. So they need that support. Fascinating stuff, John. Um, maybe I'll bring you in uh, now. I mean, I know long-term listeners might recall that you've been a big holder in Treat for many years. I know it's not exactly the same market, clearly, though they haven't, you know, they're, they're in the additives business. They're a UK manufacturer developer of, of additives, but for the beverage market. Do you, do you place Amparo next to Treat or any other, any other companies within your portfolio that you see them, you know, you see analogies or parallels? Yeah, I mean, it, sh it shares a number of uh, characteristics. Um, the The... the I suppose the two big things or three things that attracted me to Ampario initially, first of all, of course, that, you know, that it, that it was profitable and established because I don't come in, uh, in on startups or, or similar. I'm looking to, to invest in businesses that are established and are profitable, albeit small. Mm -hmm. And looking ahead, it seemed to me that, that there would be or, or should be very substantial growth over the longer term, A, because the, the world population is growing and therefore needs feeding and, and needs better quality uh, foods and more food. Obviously, sadly, huge amounts of starvation at the moment in the in the world. And secondly, Anpario, as I understand it, is totally focused on natural products. Uh, and there is, there is, uh, and Richard referred to it. There is increasing avoidance, uh, to, to put it mildly, by governments and similar. Uh, of um, uh, the toxic and the and the artificial, mm -hmm. so the combination of a growing world population and and natural seem to me to offer considerable long term opportunities for Ampario, uh, which when I first invested in 2012 uh, was a sort of mini global business, uh, seemed to me to tick a lot of boxes. Mm. Richard, so you've overseen almost all of the the public listed journey of the company. How would you sort of describe your experience of, of AIM and, and, uh, and, and those 20 years? I think, yeah, the differences in AIM now from then, there was a lot more from the fund managers. There was a lot more risk-taking. You could, you know, in those days, it may not have been necessarily right, but there was a lot of companies that were raising money with ideas and, and you know, on a piece of paper in, in some cases. So I think there was a lot more risk-taking. People were, were doing these things, and, and it, it was a lot more, I felt it a lot more positive now uh, there was, was a little bit less regulation in those. Like now I think we're more regulated than the main market. We, you know, we have a nomad, a, a nominated advisor in our stockbroker who has to go through everything we tend to put out. There's this, there's that, tick that box. Because he's he's on the line as well from you know the FCA if something's not right. So I think we're more now string, amazingly stringently regulated than the main market. And I, I think there's um, the fund managers uh, aren't as you know, taking the risks don't have, and and I think some of this is compliance departments, quite frankly, at, uh, at putting down rules that are making it more difficult for them, you know, to maybe take a punt on, you know, a, a more of a risk on on certain companies. And if you, if you're managing a portfolio of ten, some are going to go down, some are going to do average, and one or two might go to the and overall, you know, they do okay. So, yeah, there's more, there's some more regulation, more cautiousness not as much entrepreneurial sort of 
uh, risk averse spirit from from the, you know fund managers. That's interesting. Is is that to say in in turn then that you've your shareholder base looks more like you know private investors like John than institutional investors? How how, how does that look like um, now in twenty twenty four? I mean we still we still have and, and I've got a lot of respect for you know the institutions and the fund because some of them are stuck with us for a long yeah. time. But it was interesting. Yeah, it, we do get more like John private managers quite a bit on the IHT side. Mm -hmm. When we did that tender offer, there was quite a few institutions that said, oh, you, you're too small now, um, and we're not investing in anything below, they said 100 million, but it's probably more effectively 200 million market cap. Some of them were obviously need the money because they were getting redemptions, but most of the people, I, well, actually, yeah, 90 odd percent of the people that took that tender offer were fund managers and institutions. Right. So we do have less of them. We are we have been out on the road, myself and Mark, the finance director, talking to some funds to try and get them back in to buy them. But a lot of the time they want to wait for a fundraise rather than try and get in off the market because yeah. the illiquidity yeah. of that. So we are going out and marketing and trying to get some of the, the bigger funds in just to broaden and try and get more liquidity into, into the share price. But but we have we got very loyal and supportive shareholders like um, like John. But you, but you don't need you don't need clearly a, a, a fundraise at the moment. I no. mean, you're, you're very cash positive, and have been for a number of years. Uh, and unless you're contemplating a major acquisition, which might involve fundraise, you know, it, it's unlikely to happen in the short term. Exactly, we don't. Yeah, you know, we we've we got no plans. Um, yeah, you know, to to raise funds. Yeah, you know, we're looking. We're always looking at acquisitions all the time. And it's probably fair to say more recently we're looking at smaller smaller, more bolt-on ones rather than bigger ones, mm -hmm. um, mainly because that, there's, there's probably more opportunity with the smaller ones rather than, than the companies at our size or, or maybe 50% of our size is, and there's not, there's not that many opportunities. So, but, um, yeah, it, it, but I think it is good to have fund man, you know, some more fund managers in just to that li try and get more of that liquidity um, in there and in case we do need to do something that's uh, bigger in the future. Yeah. One question I did have, I mean, I suppose for people who might just be looking at Ampario for the first time, looking at your share price chart, it's obviously been a great 18 months and um, for shareholders and that tender offer has been, looks like it's played quite a big part in that. Um, you're still trading at less than half your 2021 20, peak. I think you were briefly valued at something like 32 times forward earnings. So it looks like a lot of the, the change in your market prices is, is, is down to the, the, the valuation multiple that the market has applied to your your shares more than anything else. You, was that that period a sort of a kind of a product of investor euphoria for anything, you know, ESG related, or 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 how do you explain that 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 drop in the share price? From well, the, the, I mean, twenty twenty one, we I think we we did about nearly or seven million EBITDA, mm. and if you remember at the time, there was a lot of global logistics and shipping issues, mm. so people were stocking up a bit more, and we probably had a peak in terms of. Um, sending out volume out, out you know, a bit earlier than, than than the natural peak would have been, but then what happened? You know, our profits then dropped to last year's twenty twenty three to four and a half million EBITDA. Now it's still profitable, um, you know, and that's been our worst year. You know, and and what we'd had was raw material price inflation that in, that came in very very quickly. I mean, within six or nine months, one of our um, key products in organic acid went from you know, 450 euros a ton up to 1200 euros a ton. So almost trebling. And uh, now we, you know, we passed that on, but it takes time to pass that on and it hits your margins first. So in, in 2022 and 2023, and in, in particularly 2022, you also had um, the Ukrainian, um, the, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, Ukrainian, you know, is a breadbasket of Europe producing a lot of grain, uh, a lot of canola oil, a lot of the raw materials that are used in animal feed. So animal feed prices went up. And a, and a good example of some of the reaction from that is Malaysia. The producers in Malaysia of, of poultry had this increasing import prices because they're generally Malaysia doesn't grow their own grain, corn and soya, they're importing it. So the raw material prices went up for their feed. So they were trying to then pass that on to consumers in the chicken. But the government, scared of food inflation and riots on the streets, capped the price of chicken in the supermarket shelves in Malaysia. So what did the producers do? The next time the men put chickens down to grow, they stopped. And uh, if there's no chickens eating feed, then they're not eating Amparo's feed additives. 
Now, if you look at Malaysia, I think we doubled our sales in this first half compared to the first half last year. And that is a result because that price cap went away. Raw material, you know, the, the margins in the, in the producers have come back a bit more attractive to them. They're not losing money. There was a lot of, it was it, because of this raw material feed inflation and then the consumer cost of living. So people were switching to sort of cheaper types of meat or not not eating out as much and not doing this. And you saw that in, I think, McDonald's. You know, they were under price pressure and people were eating less on that. There was a squeeze on producer margins. When there is that, then then that can affect our, um, you know, our products sold. And we had a volume drop combined with a margin drop. And that meant we went from 7 million to 4.5 million. But now we're, that's trough earnings and we're coming back out. It's quite interesting, actually. I mean, looking back, I, I first bought Treat, as I mentioned, in 2012 at 82p. Amparo. Amparo, sorry. Does they just say treat? treat. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my, that's well my fault. I, yeah, yeah. I, I actually I slipped, I slipped on, on treat because actually the same sort of thing has happened. Mm. There's, there's been this derating, as it were, of, of uh, some of these growth stocks that were probably you know, overhyped, as it were. And now, of course, they, they, they've gone the other way. So looking back on Amparo, uh, you know, I first paid 82p in 2012. I bought on, on 30, 30 further occasions at prices between 210p and 535p. The shares have been as high as you say in August 21 of 715p and today we're we're you know we're half that probably at 3 330p something something like that. So it's been a bit of a a bit of a roller coaster. Um but but during this period the cash position has remained very positive and I think I'm right in saying Richard the dividend has been increased Every year for the last... I think about 17 years now. Last yeah, 17, 17 years, years yes. Yeah. You can now get 12 weeks of an Investor's Chronicle print and digital subscription for just £12. You'll get instant access to our website and our app, plus the magazine delivered to your door every week. Check the terms and conditions in the show notes for more information. Maybe maybe you could just 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 pick up on the question of I suppose your your global footprint, Richard. And it's very interesting what you're saying about just one particular market there and how you're affected by uh, you know a number of factors which would potentially be hard to, to to see in advance. I mean, you're a 65 million pound market cap company. You develop manufacturing in the UK and distribute from here to more than 80 countries. Maybe playing devil's advocate a little bit here. It's often assumed that global reach is what every com- company wants. But can I just ask why the global footprint, given, you know, there's overheads involved in having sales teams in, in every jurisdiction. It's complicated. There are lots of things to anticipate. There's currency headwinds, et cetera, et cetera. How do you manage that, given, I suppose, the, you know, the, the relative size of Amparo? You're not a, you're not a major, major multinational, um, at least yet. How do you get that balance right? Yeah, I mean, generally, you know, yeah, people, investors do ask me, well, why are you in all these other different countries? Mm. I mean, it gives you the, the geographic diversity. So it's very important to have that in because there are global sort of flows in the way agriculture works. So, for example, we feel that having those the sales team on the ground, because we're a technical sell and a technical product, we do use distributors and we have some very good distributors, but they don't always get that technical differentiation over to the customer and then understand the local market. So... It's important that, that um, you know, we have our own people representing our products down down um, closer to the customer. Yeah, the complexity bit is all those different countries and cultures and some of the systems are different and what they're doing. And that's why we need to un- understand that feedback about how we market to those individual con- countries and with the people. What we've done is simplify the back end. So that's why we're sort of producing from one production plant. Um, we have a few suppliers that we, you know, we consistently use. And we've automated that whole process, um, centralized it from the UK and the finance and the buying and everything. And then we just ship it around the world and send it, send it on ships. So it's, it's not as complex as, as people think. The right. front end is just because of the geographic location, but we need to be in those countries to get that um, diversity. And, and our products work in a chicken, you know, the, the chicken breeds, whether it's in Brazil, China, Australia. Yeah. So, so we, we're taking, you know, we're replicating it out, and we are a niche business. So, some of our products would only go in at maybe three hundred grams per ton of feed, so a thousand kilograms. So, we, we, if if we just focused on the UK, the market's not big enough to support right. the business, unless we then ended up going into compound feed, and vitamin and mineral premix. But that's high volume, low margin. Yeah. 
John, we talked a lot about on this podcast about how you, I mean, you, you're exclusively invest in UK shares. A bit of a misnomer. I mean, you get to see the uh, production facility in, in Worksop. You know this is a UK company. It has it has this um, longevity and pedigree and background. But I mean, this is, you know, a lot of the companies you actually invest in are very, very international. Well, this is what, this is what I say to people when, when you know, when people challenge me. Uh, and say, well, you know, why do you invest in, in UK-quoted companies as distinct from investing directly in, in overseas companies? Uh, and obviously, you know, the, the, you've got the growth markets in, in, in uh, Asia and the, and the Far East. And I say to them that the majority of the companies that I invest in, like Ampario, have the advantage of UK corporate governance and clarity, but they're trading globally. Uh, and that's the combination that I like. And, of course, you get this in spades with uh, uh, with Ampario. Oh, I want to um, come on to uh, kind of the finance and, and corporate side of things in a moment. But I just wanted to um, tick off one thing, seeing as we sort of touched on it and in terms of the environmental aspect and of your, the demand. I mean, on, on the growth point, um, Richard, you're, you're, I mean, your corporate literature is saying you're committed to building you know, responsible environmental footprint that you're, you know, you're helping to reduce your clients' emissions, but also to drive global protein production. I mean, it, clearly, you know, there's this huge growing demand as, um, for animal protein, as, as John mentioned earlier. How do you resolve those two things? Because, you know, some people would say, I suppose, that sustainable uh, meat production, we aren't yet we aren't yet there. And actually, just by, by driving greater levels of animal production, we're not really on a sustainable path how do you how do you sort of balance those two views i suppose the end market is human so we have to reduce yeah. the population if you or meat consumption or well or meat consumption but it, it, you know in in the west and and places like america and, and the uk you know we do eat a higher proportion of, of meat per per head but if you look at what the chicken has done to people's nutrition i don't think anyone you can say that the, you know that how we have chicken now has been beneficial to the health and the nutrition of the industry and things like eggs of, of the UK and mm. and things like eggs. But if you're going into developing countries, I mean, for example, we're we're part of um, the International Egg Commission has got this um, a campaign about three the three six five uh, campaign, which is an egg a day, and Mexicans generally eat an egg a day. But they did a test in Ecuador a number of years ago where they gave an egg a day to malnutrition um, children and it reduced stuntedness by 57%. So there are a lot of, you know, we, we're looking at actually trying to feed those people more nutrition. So, mm. you know, why, why should the West, mm. having, you know, basically benefited from, you know, good, good chicken production and cheaper chicken uh, where we eat it probably every night or every other night, whereas 40 years ago, maybe at the weekend, there's a lot of other people out there who need that nutrition. So mm -hmm. that, that's where we're helping the humans, and we're trying to do it. We're trying to, you know, and Parry wants to try and mean that farmers can stay in business because they can um, you know, meet the needs of, of, of the growing population, but also do it environmentally sensitively um, yeah. so that the regulators say, okay, that's an efficient way and it's reducing the carbon footprint as well. And there are, and we, we are getting to that with our products. You make the gut more efficient, Uses less feed, and then you and then you're not cutting down as many you know rainforests in Brazil for the for the soy things. Turning to the the, the finance uh, side, um, and we, we we touched on the the growth and the, the dividend, the very cash rich balance sheet at the moment. Maybe John, if we can sort of bring you back in, we've we've talked a lot about the importance of dividends and income within your portfolio. Is Ampario a stock you look to deliver income? How would you characterize it within your within your holding it's, it's obviously one of the smaller companies and the dividend yield uh, has always been low um, but uh, but it's a very regular uh, dividend and it, it's been an increasing one uh, over the years so you know I've been very happy to have it in the uh, in the the portfolio but I am looking to Ampario for capital growth you know and I'm pretty confident that uh, it's on its way back and the the interim figures uh, which have just come out really, uh, you know, a very, were very encouraging, and the, the share price moved up to virtually every indicator was was positive. So, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, having been, um, you know, somewhat uh, volatile, and um, Richard talked about the reasons for the the dip in profitability, it seems to me that they're very much, you know, on the way back now, and I'm 
hoping and expecting you know, sustained growth over the next few years. They seem to be doing all the right things. Yeah. Uh, just turning to those those half year numbers, is it a case of, of just moving moving sales up higher in the, in the coming years? Yeah, sure. I, be, everything that goes you know go, goes on the top line at the moment, you know, our margin the, the gross profit would just drop to the bottom line because it goes through the production plant. It's very automated, and, and that's where you saw a bit of the operating gearing coming through in those last numbers because the volumes had gone up. So. The more we can push through, um, yeah, the workshop production facility, the more that drops to the bottom line. And it is about growing the, the top line. The problem you get when you when you diversify geographically, it's a strength and a weakness. Is you can be growing well somewhere, but then, as I say, elsewhere you may drop drop something off. But it's the resi- But I feel that that builds resilience into the share, or well, into the company. Uh, and I think that's why we did have a high rating for quite a while, was because there was that resilience on the downside. And then the potential on the upside, and sometimes, you know, if everything's firing on all cylinders, then you know you will get big step up in in growth, and we're seeing a little bit of that now, and, and in the first half. But it, it's globally, if things are sort of working in the right, going in the right direction, then that can happen. And, and then added to some of our you know business development initiatives, it can just keep going. Yeah, just finally, I, I wanted to touch on the, um, I suppose it's, it's a topic that we, we come back to quite a lot here. John, I'm, I'm sure to your delight, everyone on the, the board, it looks like, has a holding in Amparo, something um, I know you've been banging the drum for, for for quite a lot, particularly among non-execs. I mean, it looks like insider ownership, from what I could tell, amounts to about 2% collectively. But then you do also have it, both employee share plans and, and incentive plans that yeah, uh, uh, that that are connected to the, the the share options. Is there a move to sort of push the equity story within the company and, and just kind of get more buy in amongst your directors and uh, a staff in owning the shares? Yeah, I, I I mean there is. I mean the staff we we I think we've just come out of it. Or, or earlier on the share there was one the share save as you earn sort of yeah finished. I think we're looking to try and do another one again um, um, when we get that sorted out. In, in terms of um, yeah, looking at the two percent, we we have um, JTC as a trustee of this sort of employee benefit thing. So for for my example is you know I have joint share ownership of shares. Now the strike price for me anything uh, is three, is around about three pounds on average from when they were issued at certain prices. So anything below three pounds, I don't get any shares. If it's a uh, and, and I have I think one point three five million of shares in this this joint share ownership plan. When it goes above three pounds i get a proportion of that so if it goes if it doubles from three to six pounds i would get 50 percent of or be entitled to 50 percent of that 1.35 million shares i see so it 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 um it, it get the so for us for me driving the share price higher it i benefit yeah, as, Doubly, a, as a yeah, shareholder yeah. there's no point in me paying myself a great big salary or building a company paying overpaying for acquisitions to have a bigger company with more sales but the share price doesn't move anywhere. We've got to be adding, you know, improving the profitability EPS, um, so that, that share price goes up for for the for the directors and senior management to benefit. And that, that's what it's all about. It's not about just building a big company and having loads of employees, loads of sales, mm-hmm. and then paying ourselves big salaries. It is about trying to make the right investment to get the right return, and that you know feeds down into making sure we're not overpaying yeah. stupidly for acquisitions or if we you know we're getting the right acquisitions that will d- deliver value just to sort of round out this episode john um i think we need to check in on your portfolio um sound like you've been selling a few shares recently you, you told me in advance of, of what might be happening politically in the, in the next few weeks yes clearly the you know the, the the big event for investors is the budget coming up on i think 30th of october and I think I've said before in these podcasts and have, have, have written to the effect that I think a, an increase in capital gains tax is, is 100% certain uh, and inheritance tax as well. Uh, now, of course, uh, there are question marks over the, uh, the AIM market uh, and the inheritance tax advantages of, of AIM shares if you hold them for, for two years. And so the, there must be a risk that that, that, that will be taken away. I think Rachel Reeves got a difficult balancing job because, on the one hand, she needs to raise revenue, but on the other hand, she, you know, she mustn't, you know, kill entrepreneurism and and uh, business development. So it's a tricky balance. But I would have thought, 
that it's likely that the inheritance tax relief would probably go uh, in whole or part on on AIM stocks. And indeed, I think the previous Tory government, the Treasury before Labour came to power, were looking were looking at this. The present capital gains tax rate is obviously you know, quite quite low. And so what I've done is to take uh, profits on one or two stocks that I've held for a long time, out, stocks outside my ISA, um, where, where you know, if, if I realised I would have to pay capital gains tax. And so I, I've decided to, to and have sold uh, a couple of those completely, taken the, the, the low rate of capital gains tax on the chin and um, built up, I suppose, some sort of war chest, uh, to want to, to use a phrase, um, you know, waiting to see what does happen on October the 30th. Because if, for example, inheritance tax for AIM shares is moved away, then some of the AIM shares could dip down a little bit in value. Nothing nothing like, you know, they could have fallen maybe 12 or 12 or 18 months ago because I think the subject has been well aired. Mm. So I think quite a few people will have already moved out of AIM shares, as it were. But still, the, the, you know, there could be a, uh, a downward movement uh, but I've decided to keep, you know, many of my AIM shares because of their fundamental attractions and characteristics, yeah. leaving aside the inheritance tax advantage. Uh, and so this war chest will enable me to uh, hopefully, um, you know, add to one or two of my my better holdings in the AIM market. Uh, so it's a, it's wait and see. I haven't I haven't really been very active apart from building up this war chest. It's a bit of a wait and see. Richard, is, is that something that concerns you at all as the head of an AIM-listed company? Changes in the, you know, the inheritance uh, tax exemption or is it a case of, you know, you just need to stick to your knitting and you can't really worry too much about how, the, you know, the fiscal rules are going to play I, out? I, it does a bit and we, and we have spoken to fund managers and we, we're aware that fund managers are, are sitting on their hands at the moment because they're just waiting until the end of, which I think, you know, the end of, end of October. Um, but I think you see that across the whole economy. Everyone's sort of waiting. <laughs> they wanted growth and they've basically pushed it into, you know, a brick wall at the moment. So, yeah, they, I mean, you know, we, and we have been asked what happens if, the, you know, you sh- that happens, they take away the IHC and the share price drops, will you use the cash to buy in our shares? And, um, yeah, I think we would. You know, we have cash on the balance sheet. If we can move quick enough to do that, I think we would, we would try and buy in those shares because it would be undervalued. But there may be people like John and others that are also trying to buy those shares. I think it. I don't think they'll raise any more revenue. I think even with CGT, there was analysis done by the Treasury years ago that said 20% is the optimum level. And John's already maybe taking your CGT. You know, people have been selling, you know, what we hear, and, and then they probably won't afterwards if it goes up. So I don't think they're going to raise the revenue. But I do think they're going to damage Britain's um, you know, entrepreneurial and, and growth outlook by doing that because you know, capital gains tax is a risk you, you know when you're investing it's a risk so it should be a lower tax to take that to take that risk in an investment and aims suffered enough as it is over the past sort of few years i think the iht um taking that away would would be a, a big hit i mean what i would prefer them to do is to extend it instead of having in two years make it four years so you have to invest four years in or or more in in, in a uh, in a name company to to get the IHT benefit. That then is showing patient capital, longer term, you know, investment. And actually the government can then say, actually, we want long term investors who are prepared to take the risk, not jumping in and out of shares and taking a benefit. So I so but yeah, at the end of the day, I you know, we're we're trading in places like the Lebanon, like Syria, like you have more day to day things. And this company is a global company. We will continue and there's there's opportunities around the world for us to build it lots to explore in our next episode i suppose john maybe that might be post post almost budget. certainly post yeah. the budget so we'll um we'll pick up on that and of course any questions that you'd like to put to john uh, which he can do by emailing me at alex.newman at ft.com until then all that's left for me to do is to thank you for listening thank you so much richard for your time today and uh, and uh, taking the time to introduce Amparo. No, thank you for having me. It's been yeah. a pleasure. And thank you, John, as ever, for your thoughts and to thank our producer, Maddie Apthorpe, for her work behind the soundboard. Until next time.